Hello and welcome back to Desktop Publishing with Cork Express. We're now into the third episode on Cork Express 2017. There are 16 new features and 16 enhanced features. Now today I want to come back to something I talked about in the first week, uh, which is transparency blend modes. And I want to go a little bit more in depth on those. I just touched on them, I just showed they existed, but now let's try to understand them a little bit more. Well, um, let's come back to the screen here, and as you can see, uh, I've, I've got a, a, what was intended originally to be a silhouette, uh, and I was shooting this using a Lastalite highlight, which is an illuminated background. But actually, be because that illuminated background wraps the light around you, uh, I, I, I got what was a, a much more attractive uh, uh, kind of space, which really created some three-dimensionality. So I decided to, to keep that. But, of course, uh, it's more difficult to work with um, a cutout when you're doing uh, actual colour rather than just a silhouette. My original idea with the silhouette was going to be easy to cut out. This is more difficult. But what we learned uh, a couple of weeks ago is that if I just put that on there and then go to either uh, image editing, uh, which is over here, or to colours, which is over here, um, so uh, I've got my colour menu over there, I've got my image editing menu here. Um, if I go there, I can change that to uh, multiply, and uh, it multiplies the background with the foreground. Let's come out of that for a second. Uh, I'm going to move that down. So what you see is it does interfere, it does combine with the background. But if the background is relatively plain, then it will work very well. And in fact, multiply is an excellent way of doing this for this particular image because um, it then uh, gets some of the coloration of the background onto the image itself. Now, you might say, well, why would I want to do that? I'm contaminating it. Well, yes, you are, but no, you're not. If you're doing a composite, one of the things which uh, comes back again and again and again to haunt people is that they just things just don't look like they go together. And, and you, it, it's obvious that the... Uh, the picture in the foreground has got nothing to do with the background. And one of the most common reasons for that is because of a difference of color temperature. Well, what we're actually doing here is we're causing the, uh, the foreground image to inherit the color temperature of the background uh, by using multiply. Now, we could have used darken. Let's just come back in again, and we'll look at the difference between those two. So on darken, we're simply taking, in each case, uh, the darker of the two pixels. So over here, clearly it's just the artist's skin. Um, uh, over here, we're actually seeing um, so more of the, uh, the, the flesh tone, which is lighter, and then with multiply, let's just go there for a second, uh, adopts some of the coloration of the background, but with darken, it simply picks the darker of the two pixels. So uh, darken or multiply would work well for that. And if we look now through the other modes, we'll discover pretty quickly they are not that effective for this image. So uh, screen, uh, screen is like uh, projecting two projectors onto one thing. So it's always brighter. Um, then uh, overlay uh, is an overlay function. It's similar in, in, in some ways, but again, it, it's favoring the light over the dark. Uh, darken we just looked at, lighten uh, would not work for us at all, although it's an interesting effect uh, in itself. We come to color dodge. Now what dodging is doing, it's a darkroom effect, and uh, color dodge uh, is uh, brightening in the way in which you would by overexposing or underexposing a negative in a darkroom. Color burn is if you overexpose the negative, uh, and so get a, a more burned in image. Again, not the right thing for this because it brings out uh, way too much uh, uh, different coloration. And also you'll see that the, there's a bit more noise on the background. Um, shot the, uh, the background by literally pointing the camera up in the air uh, at the moment that uh, that guy was going past. And uh, it was uh, quite a nice picture, so I stuck with it. Um, but, uh, uh, color burn's not going to work for us. Hard light, uh, not working for us at all. Hard light is um, uh, overlay reversed. So it's with the uh, foreground taking the place of the background and vice versa. 
soft light, a soft version not helping us, difference uh, and exclusion. So in most cases, what we're going to find is that uh, there are modes which work and modes which don't work. Let's come down uh, the screen a little bit and let's look at this picture um, uh, which I shot for a, a business in uh, Worcestershire. Uh, and this is a great guy. And if, if you ever uh, have called to user services, uh, say hi from me, it's, he's really excellent. But um, this image is uh, shot uh, in the open air with a couple of uh, powerful Profoto battery lights. And uh, the intention was to, was to give a, a kind of exciting image. But uh, in the background, what you can't see is that I've got a bonfire. So uh, um, I was living in a very small village in Warwickshire in, in the UK and we had a bonfire and it was incredibly foggy and it got so foggy they, they, they had to stop because of health and safety because of the fireworks but, but some of the images from this are, are really quite interesting. So now let us use the bonfire as a background uh, for this image and see what happens. Well okay let's go to multiply. Ooh that's interesting. Let's go to screen, uh, shining the one on the other. Again, very interesting. Overlay, now you really see the power of overlay here. There's a, it's a mathematical uh, model which overlay uses, which is explained in, in the book, but uh, for now, just, just use it as, imagine you're putting uh, two uh, images uh, one on top of the other, which is, is in, in the old darkroom days. What we actually would have done, we would have, we would have put uh, two negatives one on top of the other, and that's what it's doing. Um, but uh, um, for, for now, uh, here, um, what you're seeing is, is that result. And that, that could be straight out of a Hollywood film poster. Um, this is Robin Hood, uh, then uh, this would be just great. So, um, okay, that's overlay. Darken, okay, darken is not really gonna work for us in this case. It looks a bit cartoonish. Uh, lighten, lighten just picks the lighter of the two pixels uh, for each pixel. Again, uh, probably a little bit uh, too obvious for us at this time. Color dodge, now look at that. Okay, you probably wouldn't want to use that in anything uh, photorealistic, but uh, in, in a, 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 the right kind of background, this is an amazing picture. Um, and now uh, uh, color burn, uh, look at that. Again, what a, a, what a wonderful, uh, glowing effect again, only for the right shot in the right time, but, but in the right context that could do wonders for you. Hard light. Now, you're probably thinking this is, this is the least interesting, uh, of all, uh, these effects. In fact, you're probably going to say, you know, what's the point of that? Um, it, it's, it's just a little bit of coloration. But if we go back to hard light again and look at the effect we're really getting there, um, this is the most powerful of all of them for this particular image combination because it's implying this background. It's implying a man shooting in the firelight rather than uh, rather obviously just uh, showing the, uh, the fire uh, on top of the man. So that's overlay. Um, and uh, hard light has switched the two around. That's what hard light does, it is, it is overlay with the foreground and background reversed. Um, and that's quite evocative. Soft light, um, okay, uh, we're going backwards, I think, perhaps in this particular case, to uh, something which is a little bit too obvious, but again, if you're getting the right shot, that'll be fine. Difference, uh, not going to work for us here. Difference is um, much more powerful when we are using it as part of image logic. I'm going to talk about image logic in a future episode. Um, but for now, and now exclusion, again, it's light difference, it's mathematically similar, again, not going to help us in this case. So let's go back to uh, hard light, uh, and what we're seeing is that uh, we now have the ability to conform the image to the layout uh, in a way which wasn't previously possible. Now, with all of these things, it's really important to understand that Quark Express is not trying to replace Affinity Photo, Capture One, Photoshop, or your favorite photo editing application. Uh, what it's there for is to give you uh, results which are best achieved in the layout. So you're not going on these extensive round trips uh, backwards and forwards to Photoshop or Affinity or whatever it is, uh, but you can work straight into Quark at the point you should. So uh, do not uh, ditch your other software. 
uh, make sure that you've got the right photo editor. Uh, I personally uh, develop things using Capture One. Uh, as my raw developer, I came out of a, a Nikon D800 into Capture One, and that's gonna give me my best possible quality. And once I've got the image exactly right, that's when I bring it into Quark and start working on it as part of the layout. And that saves me, again, a great deal of time. Well, uh, let's come down the way uh, and um, look at a third image, which uh, is problematic for me. Now, this uh, I took at a, a Tewkesbury reenactment. So uh, for those of you who don't live in uh, Britain, uh, back in the uh, 1430s, no, it must be later than that, the, the 1450s and 60s, I guess, uh, we had uh, the Wars of the Roses, and uh, they came to an end in 1485. I know that because I once stayed in a house that had been built that same year. Uh, but it was a, a big uh, war between uh, the uh, um, two uh, rival sets of barons, uh, the House of York. I'm from Yorkshire originally, so it's important to me. The House of Lancaster, who of course the enemy. Uh, and um, the Battle of Tewkesbury uh, was a, a very fundamental battle in, in that. And, and so every year they reenact the entire battle in Tewkesbury in England. So if you come to Tewkesbury, it's in Gloucestershire, then do visit that uh, at the right time of year. But in this particular image, um, we've got um, a, a great sky behind the photographer. So look at, look at these reflections here. So behind her, I'm standing, you've got this lovely blue sky, but you also see there's cloud. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, for the image I was shooting, the cloud, uh, sorry, on the wrong page now, the cloud predominated over the image, so we get this blown out background. Now, often a blown out background is just what I want, but in this particular case, it's not. So, how are we gonna solve this one? Well, what I've got here is I have, uh, for the background of this, let's just come down to colors now, um, uh, put that back in, um, and I'm gonna get rid of image editing, I'm not using that right now, I'm gonna do all this in colors. What I've done is I have uh, created a background called Tewkesbury Sky. You can't see that because of the picture in the foreground. But if I now come to the picture in the foreground and change the mode to darken, in comes the sky. And again, uh, this is not a cutout as such. Um, it's uh, a transparency blend. Uh, and so uh, the result is that in, instead of having to spend uh, arguably half an hour or an hour, carefully cutting out in my image editing application of choice, I just bang, uh, throw it in, uh, and it's working straight away uh, in Quark Express. So um, how do I get to that color actually? It's quite an interesting little story because um, my first thought was to, to use cyan as the background. But if I, if I just go to, uh, to cyan now uh, as the background color, so I, as you see over here, uh, in my colors, I've got the frame color. Uh, I've got the, um, uh, so you can't see me, you're seeing, seeing a picture of me. So I've got the frame color over here. I've got the, uh, the picture color and I've got the background color. Um, so I hope you can see those three things. Um, so of the background color, I've got this thing called Tewkesbury Sky and that's a gradient which I've created. Um, so my, um, my first thought was to uh, go to cyan. Cyan's always a kind of good starting place for the sky. The sky never is cyan, but it's a good place to start. Uh, and so I tried that, um, uh, but uh, the, the result of, of just cyan, let's just take that color for a second, uh, where's it gone, cyan, was really not, not what I wanted. So um, I, I, I created a new color, which I'm, I'm gonna call sky two. And the way I did this was uh, I uh, using, let me just get rid of the um, transparency there so that you can, you can see it a little bit better. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to normal. Uh, and um, I, I used the, the sky reflected in the guy's helmet. And I, I used with colors, uh, I used the eyedropper to just pick up that color. Uh, and that gave me this color sky. The problem was that um, sky was still the wrong color for the sky. You'd think if you take a reflection of sky, it's gonna be right, but it wasn't. And he did something which was a mix 
of uh, cyan and that color. So what did I do? Uh, I created a new color called Sky 2. And, and the, the difference between Sky 1 and Sky 2 is that, um, actually no, I, yeah, exactly, I, I, I made this as a spot color. So uh, it came in as RGB, but you can specify the spot. Now, if you now go to create a new color and you go to multi-ink, you can take Sky 2 and process cyan and uh, give, say, 50% process cyan, 50% Sky 2. And I've got a new color, which uh, has uh, some of the coloration of uh, Sky 2, but is also much more cyan -y. And so uh, the resulting color, which I then made, uh, I'm calling it Sky Mix. You can see that over here. And uh, Sky Mix looks like this. Now, what I, after I'd done that in multi -ink, I just changed it back to CMYK. I didn't want to play with multi-ink. That might create some problems later on. You might actually think I'm trying to output multi-ink. But it's quite a clever way of mixing two colors uh, in, in Quark Express. And so I went to the gradient, uh, and um, I, I created this gradient, Cheeks Blue Sky. I gave it a 70% gradient, um, uh, and uh, then simply applied that to this background here. So if I, for a second, let's just delete that image. Um, we're, we're going to come back to it. Um, that's, that's the gradient which I've got. 70%. Um, uh, Command-Z or Control-Z brings, brings back my image. And I'm now going to have a look at Multiply. Uh, could be. Uh, screen, no. Overlay, definitely not. Darken. We'll come back to darken. Lighten, no. Color dodge, absolutely not. Color burn, no. Hard light, uh, no, that's the opposite of what I want. Soft light, again, no. Difference, no. And exclusion, no. It's either multiply or darken. So let's just look at those two. And uh, with multiply, I'm getting worn effect. Uh, and with darken, I'm getting a slightly, a slightly brighter effect. Um, usually, if I'm thinking of multiply, I always look at darken as well. If I'm thinking of darken, I always look at multiply as well. Uh, the effects are similar. Multiply multiplies the two values together. Uh, math is explained in the book. Uh, darken simply picks the darker of the two pixels. But there you have a perfect sky uh, in just uh, a few moments by creating uh, a, uh, an appropriate gradient and by using the eyedropper in the colors, uh, I can make sure that the sky really does match the sky we're talking about. That's all we've got time for uh, this time. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Happy corking. See you next time.